Well, well good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks. Nice to have you here. My name is Ross Virginia. I direct the Institute of, the Ar of Arctic Studies, a uh, unit of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. I'm also a faculty member in the Environmental Studies program. And it's a real pleasure to provide the opportunity for a visiting fellow at the Dickey Center in Arctic Studies, Adam Pearson, to talk about his work and, and why he's here and, and um, to connect the Ukraine to the Arctic, which is uh, a number of years ago that might have been a challenge. Now it's really a pressing and very important question. So we're going to hear more about that. Um, he, he comes to us from the Ecologic Institute in Berlin. Um, he's a Transatlantic Fellow and the Conrad von Moltke Fellow at that institute. And um, when I realized that he was the Conrad von Moltke Fellow, um, I thought I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about Conrad. Um, Conrad uh, was a long-term faculty member at Dartmouth in the Environmental Studies program. Um, he was born in 1941 and passed away in 2005. And Conrad was one of the mentors of me when I first came to Dartmouth in 1992, the charity Environmental Studies program. I knew very little about Dartmouth. I knew very little about European political and environmental affairs. And Conrad kind of took me under his wing and, and really was an influential person in the development of my time here at Dartmouth. So let me say a few words about Conrad, and then I'll get uh, back to Adam. Um, Conrad was, was born in a region of what is now Poland, um, and he was born into one of the most famous German military families that, that, there, that you could imagine, the von Moltkes. Um, at the end of the Second, war, Second World War, war um, Conrad's mother, Freya, um, and uh, uh, Conrad and, and his, the rest of his brother, they took refuge. They moved um, out of Germany into South Africa. And uh, Conrad sort of grew up in, in that environment. Um, his father, um, Count Helmut von Moltke, was executed right near the end of the war, um, as uh, viewed as a collaborator and a member of the resistance and speaking openly about the future of Germany post Hitler. So he was a very controversial political leader and a very famous person in, um, in the German resistance movement. So Conrad was, was sort of grew up in South Africa, um, but his mother eventually moved to the US. And that drew Conrad back to the US, drew him to Dartmouth, where he majored in mathematics. Um, somehow he went from mathematics to earning a PhD in medieval history in Germany. Um, he, was, he was the true person of liberal arts. Um, anyone who knew Conrad knew him as that, that sort of broadly defined eclectic scholar who was interested in everything and had something interesting and passionate to say on just about every topic. And he was six foot seven, six foot eight, very imposing person. And when he spoke, you really listened to Conrad. That's one thing I remember about him. Um, uh, Conrad eventually moved back um, to the US in 1984 to live adjacent to his mother, Freya. Freya spent many, many years living in Norwich, Vermont, and, and she was uh, probably our most famous resident, certainly a fixture in the community of Vermont. Um, so Conrad became a, a faculty member in environmental studies, focusing on European environmental policy. And Conrad, what he taught me early on was that the academic world needed to connect to the practitioner world. And that's really what he did. He bridged those both. He was an active political leader, but he was also um, a, a true scholar. And, and one of his major accomplishments was founding the journal called International Environmental Affairs, a journal for research and policy. And this was uh, founded here at Dartmouth, edited by Conrad, and really developed a, a scholarship that bridged practice to uh, academics. Um, so, so Conrad uh, uh, touched many people here at Dartmouth, both from his research and his teaching. Um, and and we, we certainly miss him. Um, Conrad's mother, Freya, died at the age of 98, not that long ago. Um, and she was awarded a Doctor of Humane Letters by Dartmouth College in 1999 in recognition of all of her contributions, both to the community, but also her important role in understanding World War II and its history. Um, many of the important meetings of the underground in Germany were held at the, at the large <coughs> residency of the von Molkis. And these were secret meetings. And um, uh, Freya kept track of these meetings and kept track of the correspondence with her husband. And her journals and her letters become, have become one of the primary sort of sources of materials for academics trying to understand the resistance to Nazi Germany during the war. So that's a very lasting contribution to understanding that period that came from 
both von Moltke's. So um, a little bit about the von Moltke's, their history, their connection to Dartmouth and Norwich. Um, look them out, they're both amazing people, uh, quite a family. So now back to Adam, the, the true feature here, um, Adam Pearson. Um, Adam's background is in environmental engineering uh, in the atmosphere and energy program at Stanford, uh, both his bachelor's degree and his master's. And the Stanford program is well known for its, its interdisciplinary curriculum that really connects engineering to critical problems, policy problems, human problems, social problems. And I think Adam's work really sort of shows that Stanford label and, and the tradition of that program. Um, he's at Ecologic. Ecologic is a very highly respected independent think, think tank based in Berlin, but they have offices in a number of locations. And what Ecologic is known for is, I think, what they call transdisciplinary research, research that connects fields of science to the social and economic uh, issues wrapped around sustainability. How do, how do we draw um, um, science, technology, and society into understanding better solutions leading to more sustainable futures, particularly around pollutions related, uh, issues related to the environment, such as pollution and energy use. So with his background in engineering, he's, he's been involved in lots of different projects with Ecologic. They, they work, he works on technical, the sociological, economic, and the governance aspects of what some people call decarbonization. How can we lower our carbon footprint on the planet? How can we live a more sustainable life using less energy? Um, so this is a very interdisciplinary field that's drawn his engineering background into politics and other areas. Um, so one little side story here. This last week, uh, a number of some Dartmouth were at a meeting at the Carnegie Endowment for an International Peace in Washington. And it was a high level policy practitioner meeting looking at the future policy for the U.S. related to the Arctic and what should it be. Um, the U.S. is going to be chairing the Arctic Council. This is a, the major intergovernmental uh, policy organization for the Arctic nations. And this happens in May 2015. And there's a lot of buzz right now about how should the U.S. take leadership, what should be the key issues, and we were there to meet about that. And one of the things that kept coming up over and over and over again in the room was the word Ukraine. And I've never been to an Arctic meeting where we actually spent so much time thinking about the Ukraine. And we're going to find out more about that today. But the, the relationships between the U.S. and Russia are critical for advancing climate change policy and for protecting the future of the Arctic. And Ukraine sits right in the middle of all of that. And that was what we talked about and learned about at this meeting. So um, Adam uh, has a presentation titled The Energy Crisis in Ukraine, What It Means for the US, Europe, and the Arctic. So please join me in a warm welcome for Adam Pearson. Welcome, and it's an honor to be here, truly an honor to be here. Um, in the name of the Von Molka family, I, I've been staying in Norwich, and uh, I actually got to see where Conrad uh, used to live, so it's quite, quite interesting, kind of full circle experience being a Conrad Von Molka fellow and being here in Dartmouth. It's been really enriching. Um, so thank you all for your warm hosp hospitality and welcoming, here, welcoming me here. Um, I am Adam, and I'm from California, so I, just to introduce myself, I like uh, music and Mexican food and craft beer, so if you like that stuff too, maybe we can talk later. Um, and, you know, I, I'm in a field that's not something that you think about going into when you're five years old. Uh, you know, I, I was like into trains and stuff at that time. You don't think, oh, I'm going to be studying geopolitics in Europe, <laughs> I'm going to be studying Putin when I'm five years old. I was, I was kind of like this guy. And then I decided a little bit later that I wanted to go into um, saving the planet, saving the polar bears. And then eventually it just sort of brought me to Putin and Russia and everything. It just it wasn't expected. Um, but anyway, today I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how things happened in Ukraine. I don't want to be, you know, talking version of Wikipedia, because that's what Wikipedia is for. Um, oh, this is, I don't know. The, it's just a nice comic about climate change. What if it's a big hoax and this is all for nothing? Um, 
Anyway, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened in Ukraine, uh, some of the energy security concerns, and then what Russia might do, followed by how this impacts the Arctic. So um, I want to actually kick it to you guys, to you all, your, my, my dear audience. Uh, just Roth mentioned that this has come up um, in, in the Arctic meeting. It's, it's very important. I, I want to ask why you're here and, and why you think this issue is important to anybody who wants to um, just maybe take 30 seconds. And, any ideas? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. In the EU, it's a really big political topic at all levels of society. Yeah. Any other just personal feelings on this? Well, if Putin's at war with Ukraine right now, he shuts off the tab. You have to get the energy from someplace. Yeah. So, where are they going to get it from? Yeah, and that's 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 what I'll talk a little bit about. How how the numbers work out. They don't look good, <laughs> um, but but yeah, I mean this is an important issue. We've heard about this already. Ross gave a, Professor Virginia gave a, a really good insight to this, and and even Ambassador uh, Daniel Benjamin here at the Dickey Center has called uh, what's happened in Ukraine the most flagrant offense against the international mm -hmm. order in more than two decades. So um, putting some context on this, this is important. We also see kind of a historic low in trust between East and West Russia and the rest of the rest of the world that we haven't seen maybe since um, the early 90s. So um, yeah, I'll start off with a little bit of a background and then, as I said, we'll move closer to the Arctic through the course of this presentation. So what happened? Um, the first thing that happened, uh, well, I'll, I'll start in 2009 because uh, the first time I went into Europe, people were talking about this a lot. I went to Europe first in 2010. I'm from, I'm from San Diego originally. Um, in 2010, I, w I visited Hungary and the uh, Hungarian ministers who were greeting us and welcoming us, these Stanford kids who were you know, studying abroad and half the, half the group was just falling asleep because they had drank too much the previous night. So this hu poor Hungarian minister is explaining to us the, why Hungary is uh, you know, feeling so threatened by Russia. Because in Hungary, they didn't have any, um, they had lost access to energy for 13 days in 2009 lost complete access to natural gas, um, Russia or Ukraine, very disputed, they argue about it still. One of the parties turned off, cut the taps, and um, Eastern Europe was really affected, so Hungary, Austria, the Balkans, and so on. Um, so this was kind of a, a story about how the Hungarian economy was really struggling and really feared this kind of relationship and how, how Russia had a stranglehold over the Hungarian um, supply of natural gas. So, uh, I'll start off with this, this 2009 uh, conflict, this energy conflict in January 2009. Um, Ukraine and Russia have been friendly neighbors when it comes to energy for a while now. If Russia charges Ukraine a lot more than they charge the rest of Western Europe, um, because they can, I guess, and they also want to assert that this is um, Russia, Ukraine, you know, we're, we're giving you the energy. That's a little editorial of, of me, but I mean, they, that's, that's a reality though. They actually charge Ukraine more. Um, Ukraine also has poor infrastructure for measuring energy consumption. So I believe that things have improved over the last five years, but um, part of the reason why there's such great dispute over how much money Ukraine owes Gazprom is that um, the, the taps don't actually measure in some parts of Ukraine, so it's, it's unclear actually how much Ukraine is consuming from a broad perspective. Uh, so, so they have a friendly relationship going back to 2009. So then what happened next? Um, EU, I, I've been in the EU for a while now. I can sort of uh, make fun of it a little bit. I think I can jab at it a little bit. Um, the EU looks, at, looks east at its uh, neighbors kind of like projects. So they think, okay, we're Europe, we want to continue to, to integrate more of Europe, and uh, we'll slowly continue this process, and the, the, East, the Eastern project, you know, Ukraine is in this Eastern project, we might want to integrate Ukraine into the EU at some point. So they, they come to Ukraine, negotiations over a while, and, and the EU says to Ukraine, well, we'd like, a, we'd like to do a free trade deal with you, uh, because we would like to uh, help you become more European. And so Ukraine thinks, um, well, half of Ukraine, or probably more than half, 
in terms of population, but a large part of Ukraine wants this, wants Europeanization, the western part of Ukraine predominantly. Uh, the eastern part of Ukraine is still heavily Russia, he heavily ethnically Russian, um, and their excitement was not so, they, they, their excitement didn't really match. Um, anyway, what had happened was the EU came to Ukrainian prime minister and said, please, we would like to sign this with you. What do you think? Um, there were this, these negotiations were called the Ukrainian-European Union Association Agreement. Um, and so, so the EU decided, you know, you're either with us or you're with Russia. And uh, the government was sort of pressured into making a decision, and the government ultimately decided to, to sign a, a conf uh, an opposing deal with the Russian government to reaffirm their uh, affiliation with the Russian government. So this is what happened in November of 2013. So this started um, to upset some people in Ukraine, and some protests began. Um, the threat of, so, so Russian trade sanctions could have come had um, the, the government gone ahead and signed this European Union Free Trade Agreement. And uh, I think the, the government was pressured by Russia. That's just my kind of personal belief. They're also being pressured by EU. I'm not gonna make a judgment on uh, President Yanukovych uh, in, in how he did things. I mean, I'm not an expert on, on uh, politics in, in Ukraine, but um, he made his decision. So the Ukrainian people are also quite upset about some other things going on in Ukraine. I have this slide here on the top left. You can see this is from Transparency International, and they kind of judge how corrupt countries are. Um, and the red is corrupt, and the yellow is less corrupt. So um, Ukraine is ranked 144th out of 177 countries in the world. Um, I can't remember Russia's probably something like that, too. Very, very red, very, very corrupt state, very, very centralized state. Yeah, I'm not going to go into the details of how they make these assessments, but it's quite interesting to get a, a background that Ukrainian centralized government was um, not doing such a great job for its people. Um, and this is part of, part of why people were upset in addition to the, the Europeanization versus um, Russianization question that came up with this EU free trade discussions. And then police brutality, this came out in the protests um, sort of escalated the, the frustration and, uh, I guess, pure anger that some of these, these Western Ukrainians were feeling. So um, they, wanted, they wanted to impeach the president, they wanted uh, snap elections, and they wanted Europeanization rather than uh, the opposite. So there was a revolution, and I found it pretty interesting. I've, I've spoken to some Ukrainians this year, and many of them think that the the replacement, um, Yatsenyuk, was not really uh, particularly popular before um, he sort of became the, the replacement. But he, has, he comes from eastern part of Ukraine, so he has this, uh, he could unite the, the maybe Russian-leaning parts of Ukraine with the, the more western parts of Ukraine where the capital is. Um, but he hasn't lasted, so he wasn't particularly popular, and um, he's, he's no longer in there. So anyway, Ukraine was annexed by Russia, and um, there was a 96% referendum where the people in Crimea voted to be a part of Russia. This was disputed by the West, um, but I think it's important to consider that they have Russian media, that they have um, neighbors across the across the lake, it's the Black Sea, I believe, uh, who make more money per, per capita over the year. It's kind of a, you know, grass is greener situation. Why am, why am I not doing as well as my, my friends across the border? Um, just something to think about because I think it's, this discussion gets really simplified in the Western media, but there is some real, um, their neighbors, their friends, the people who come visit them on vacation in Crimea, um, these are Russians, so, so it's really part of their community, part of their identity is a little bit Russian. Um, 
So this, this referendum, 96%, I mean, 96% is very, very strong, but that was, that was what came out of it. And um, yeah, again, important to think about the Ukrainian state and how it was very centralized power in the West and kind of not really effective at uh, governing its citizens ahead of time. And that's kind of a broad statement that I'm not gonna <laughs> go into backing up, but um, a lot of experts would, would support that. So yeah, Russia came in um, and I just wanted to, to reflect that in 2008, Russia told, made a statement to NATO that if NATO were to further expand, Russia would annex Crimea. So they kind of drew a red line in 2008. So they, this was not a response to NATO expansion, um, but it was a response to a kind of Europe, Europeanization of Ukraine. And in a Europeanization of Ukraine, Ukraine would um, first step sign a free trade agreement, and then in the process of maybe even becoming a European Union member state, they would have to join NATO. There is not a single European Union member state who is not a part of NATO. So this is kind of um, an idea to show that this was not maybe an uh, improvised action um, or even pre-planned. This, um, this is not... <coughs> It's not improvisation and not the result of an initiative, as Dmitry Trenin wrote. It's quite interesting. This is kind of, um, in their mind, their, their reading of the situation, rather than we're going to be really aggressive and commit a whole bunch of human rights violations. So again, just trying to be a little bit provocative of what might come out in the, the media here in the US um, from, from some, some <laughs> European kind of perspective, Eurasian kind of perspective. So that's sort of what happened. What, what can Europe do? Well, can they use military? Um, well, that's not really, not really Europe's specialty anymore. Um, it's been demilitarization since World War II. The, the European Union is all about peace. It's a foundation, so it's not really, not really a good idea, I don't think. And here we see um, European military. I think, I think this guy's from Germany. Um, <laughs> what about what about what are the other things that that uh, Europe can do? Well, we they kicked out um, Russia from the, the Mickey Mouse Club or the G8. Uh, this is kind of funny comic. Um, so Russia's response to this and says, well, you know, our, our membership in the G8 is optional. It's not doesn't doesn't mean much to us. So G7 has met this year. Many times. So, so this really leaves uh, something like sanctions, economic leverage, um, and here we see the missiles of signatures, pen signatures. So this brings us back to energy security, if we talk about sanctions. So Europe gets a quarter of its gas from Russia, half of that passes through Ukraine, and I've kind of, this is just a really simple map, you can see a circled where Ukraine is, um, there's a lot of blue that goes through there, isn't there? So things, things have gotten a little better over the last few years, better from a Western European perspective of consuming natural gas, <laughs> because up here on the top, use this nifty pointer, the Nord Stream pipeline is finally completed. So Russia is able to send gas to Germany through underwater, and they you know, deliberately went in Industry went in together, wanted to build this because they kind of suspected something in 2009 might happen again. Uh, so this has reduced the burden a little bit. Now Germany is actually in a position where they're able to buy gas directly from Russia and then sell it to Ukraine, which is a little bit strange. Um, so this is, <laughs> this is an example of how critical of a node this is uh, from, a, from a pipeline perspective. Um, furthermore, I think it's important to note that Natural gas is going to continue to be consumed. In fact, continue to increase in consumption. Europeans will continue to increase consuming natural gas. Um, and so it's, it's really important to, to note that, that this is going to just get worse over time from that perspective. Um, so. This here is a, an image on energy use in Europe. Um, we see that natural gas is non-trivial. It's, what is it? It's the uh, orange line here. So it's this one up here. So 
natural gas is going to continue to play a major role in the European economy. Renewables are down here. So the, this is just, I'm just setting the stage. This is reality. This is the situation. Uh, if the gas cuts off, I don't need to spell it out. If, you're, if, if Russia cuts the gas to, to all of Europe, um, if, if Russia cuts the gas to, to Ukraine, uh, there might be concern that they'll cut the gas to all of Europe, and that's a huge part of the European economy. This is just showing that the European economy is not decoupled from natural gas. European economy would be in trouble. There might be better images to show this, but this is just an idea that the energy sector is pretty heavily dependent on natural gas. Um, so again, I don't need to spell it out. This is, this is a, a fear right now. Um, so this brings me to some of the research that we've done. So I want to spend a few minutes kind of going over this framework. It's a, it's a big, it's a big uh, thing of text here. Don't, you don't need to really read it. If anything, just focus on the left-hand side for now. And I'll kind of walk you through this. So in our research, um, I'm working on a project on European low carbon energy security. The, we look at energy security not from an import-export balance perspective, but from a holistic perspective across technical aspects and other aspects. So for example, stability would refer to a kind of disruption in the system, an instantaneous access to energy. So in a, a disruption to the system, we would lose access to, uh, let's say, natural gas, right? So, but flexibility refers to the ability of a system to cope with short-term uncertainty. So this is like how much, um, how big, how much storage do we have in the pipelines that can fill in the gaps? Or another example would be with the electricity system. So if windmills are, are turning and the windmills don't um, produce the, what they're expected to produce over a 15 minute interval, that could be very problematic. So do we have another kind of energy resource on the grid that we can turn on to cover it? So, so flexibility is kind of a shorter term temporality here. Resilience is on the weak time scale. So um, disruptions, uh, deliberate use of market power. So this is something like what happens if uh, OPEC stops sending their ships to the US for like a week, a few weeks? You know, that's, that's gonna be a big, big issue um, strategically. A little bit different from flexibility. Flexibility is on the shorter time scale. Adequacy has to do with the market design. I'm not gonna go into it because um, it's not relevant for what I'm going to talk about. And then robustness has more to do with the long-term uh, planning of energy resources. So from the perspective of, of what this situation is like, um, I think where Europe really is, is in trouble <laughs> um, is from the perspective of stability, of course, as well as resilience and robustness. So the EU does not have a slam dunk for heating uh, the heating sector, so most natural gas is used in the heating sector. Um, so that means if there is no more natural gas that the EU can access, um, they, they're, they're, there's just nothing they can replace it with. You know, we don't have tanks of like propane sitting at home, you know, just to like provide us for, with heat for the winter. So this is a big issue. Robustness, long-term situation, if there's a, a big conflict between Europe and Russia, we can no longer really rely on Russian resources in our planning. Um, I kind of, I did it, I tried to, just to liven this up a little bit, I, I, I did this, I wrote pain, I just sort of explained this, um, and I think Europe is actually addressing the areas that where they need to address um, and that they can control. So I, d I don't think that they can really, this can be changed at any time by Gazprom, so I, I guess I didn't focus on this because it's really hard to, um, this is up to really Putin and his oligarch friends, whether they initiate this kind of pain. Um, so to address resilience, what is the EU doing? Um, they're reversing the pipeline, they're, they're, they're doing pipeline reversals. This is like an engineering kind of solution. And this is an image in, in Slovakia where some white dudes who are powerful are uh, opening up a new pipe, pipeline reversal. Um, so an another question is, uh, so then let's move to the question of, um, excuse me, not stability, it's uh, uh, the long-term resource planning, robustness, yeah. So people like to talk about fracking a lot here in the US. I don't like to talk about fracking a lot. <laughs> um, but people ask, what about, what about in Europe? 
Well, um, first of all, we see here a map of where there is frackable resources, and it's, it's not as good. Uh, and then additionally, there's a lot more political, it's not as politically acceptable in Europe. As you can see, this map is actually um, designating which states allow it and don't. So for example, Fran France totally bans it, Germany allows it, but has permits. So this gives you an idea of how complicated it is within the EU about like coming up with a strategy on fracking. It's a little bit, it's a little bit difficult to imagine fracking taking a, a big part of some of replacing some of this potential Russian gas that will be gone, right? So fracking can only provide, I think, um, here's the numbers. In 2020, in best case scenario, four billion cubic meters. Um, in the US, we currently have 20 billion cubic, me cubic meters. And the economist estimated that the amount of gas that would need to be replaced if Russia turns off the taps through Ukraine for all of Europe would be around 50 billion cubic meters. So this is not even a solution along, along a, a 20, 2020 time scale. So what about renewables? How about renewables helping? Well, renewables only, first of all, address the sector of natural gas that is used in electricity, which is not nearly as large as the sector um, where natural gas is used in most, which is heating. Okay, but maybe we can still make an impact. Um, this is an, an image of what would what Desert Tech project might look like. Desert Tech is this it's kind of failing, dying now. The idea of, of linking some, some of these resources down in North Africa, some good sunlight, some good wind, getting this to Europe um, so that they don't have to use natural gas. Again, I, I don't want to go too much into this. We've done some work on this. This is, um, there are a lot of issues technically with, with directly replacing renewables, renewables for natural gas. Um, natural gas is a little bit more flexible, but it's, it's still possible. Um, there are still some geopolitical issues with this, that it's creating a whole other bag of worms, basically. That's my, I, I would say that this is not a solution. Um, and to even build this, it will take till 2050 anyway. So there's, there's a lot of, it's a real issue here. So I, I think um, I've, now here, I just showed that the heating is, is the biggest chunk. Industry is also a significant chunk too for um, consumption of natural gas. So this graph is just demonstrating that it's a multi-sectoral problem. Uh, we don't have a good idea for what to do in heating. And we do have some ideas in electricity, AKA renewables, but they can't be built quickly enough at the scale that we would need. So this is a big problem. We can't reach these 50 billion cubic meters um, that would go away. We can't do it with LNG imports because they won't be nearly um, large enough and the market isn't there yet. So, so our recommendations here, they're simple and it's not gonna, gonna make the math work, but it's uh, kind of steps in the right directions just to um, empower local communities in, in the rest of Europe to, to use decentralized renewables to build them out themselves so that they don't have to rely on Northern Africa, for example, or the Middle East, and then introduce as many heating, uh, building efficiency measures as possible. Okay, okay. Um, I think I wanna get to the Arctic, so I'm gonna go through this a little bit quickly, uh, and I might skip some, but, but basically Russia is in a position where um, the predominating operating principle up until about September was that we'll just do sanctions here in the US and the EU, and this will you know, cause pain to Russia and they're gonna change their mind. But it, Russia's not gonna give up um, Ukraine just to avoid some, some sanctions. Um, this is kind of the way I was framing it in my mind. What, U, U.S. wants Russia to change things. Um, okay, this is obvious. They're not going to change things if you don't do anything economically, but um, can we imagine this, <laughs> this kind of space? That's, that's what I would just like to suggest. Um, and then, so, so for Russia, again, they start off, this is, I don't, I, this is just a, a quick, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the, the idea is um, Russia is, a, is in a position where if they return Crimea, <coughs> they literally don't get anything out of it. The, it's not going to change any kind of um, economic relationship. The US and EU has already lost trust in, Europe, in, in, in Russia, excuse me. So there's, there's literally no incentive for, for Russia to suddenly like, return Crimea for some reason. So that, that, that's just my point in this. Okay. 
In September, though, the US um, initiated some new sanctions. I think these sanctions are actually quite effective. The sanctions impacted oil companies. Exxon had to pull out from uh, a gas field where they, they discovered some oil recently, and this really hurt um, Russia, because Russia doesn't have the technological capabilities to really um, build, build these kinds of plants themselves right now, so they really rely on foreign co-investment projects together in order to do this. Um, so, so while this isn't going to affect Russia's oil um, output, not talking about gas right now, talking about oil in the Arctic, um, th this hurts Russia's sort of strategic partnerships with American and European oil companies. So that hurts Russia from like a long-term economic perspective. It mainly hurts Putin's oligarch friends. But I think it's been effective so far in the sense that that actually will upset Putin, unlike um, the previous kinds of sanctions that were, were levied. And then there was a recent, recent uh, deal announced where Russia signed a contract with China where they're going to be delivering a whole bunch of natural gas to China. And so this is sort of symbolically demonstrating the, the, the shift in geopolitical shift. Russia is orienting towards China, um, kind of guessing maybe that the European market might not be there so much. We think about this from a European perspective. So Europe um, is dependent on Russia. But Russia is also dependent on Europe, because Russia is currently selling most of their gas to Europe. And in fact, Russia's economy is completely dependent on oil and gas exports as well. It's 16% of the GDP, the largest single chunk. And their economy is oil and gas. Um, mining is 11%. So Russia is in the business of extracting, make, extracting profit from the land. And all these people who are making money of it, off of it are in Putin's inner circle. Um, so this is this is this is the this is how Russia operates. They're in the business of um, of using resources. So what does this mean for the Arctic? Well, this uh, new Chinese partnership for Russia is interesting. Um, China is pretty proactively trying to get involved in the Arctic Council as well as India. This is what this image is demonstrating. But Russia is a little bit torn because Russia um, has always took the position of, you know, we only want the, uh, the, the, the Arctic states to have access to some of these resources. We, we really feel strongly about this. We want this to be Arctic space. We want, yeah, in terms of oil and everything. But on the other hand, Russia is completely dependent on economic cooperation from multinational companies. As I mentioned before, they don't have the technical expertise to really profit off of some of these offshore drilling projects in the Arctic. So it's, a, it's an interesting situation. Um, it's unclear how this relationship is going to work out, but it's, it's China, China and India are kind of um, moving into the Arctic space to kind of uh, observe, but also there might be something more economic as a part of it. And uh, my colleagues and I at Ecologic Institute, we have some thoughts on uh, military security. We think that, that Russia's... Um, Russia's actually been a pretty cooperative member of the Arctic Council in terms of Arctic security, Arctic military security. We don't believe that this uh, kind of escalation of things in Ukraine is going to really directly um, make this an arms race or make this kind of like a war in the Arctic. But, but instead, it's just sort of going to make it um, difficult for the kinds of cooperative measures that have been taking place over the, year, over the years. So there are cooperative measures between the Norwegian military and the Russian military, where they they run these uh, military uh, I don't know like practices. I think that's the wrong word. There's some kind of like joint missions and, and stuff like that together. Um, and so it's, this is much more limited now because the EU and well Norway's not in the EU, but they're basically in the EU. And the U.S. have have said okay, no military cooperation with Russia, etc. So. Um, I think last week, Ross, Ross brought up the, the meeting in, in Washington, D.C. I was, was really fortunate to be there. I think the, 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 the kind of position and ever, what everyone wants in the Arctic community is to really just try to keep the Ukrainian issue outside of the Arctic as much as possible and try to operate as much from a cooperative perspective in the Arctic uh, as we can and to just really let the, the Ukraine um, 
Ukraine thing work itself out and not interfere in the Arctic. And I think, I think Russia, from their Arctic lens, wants that too. Um, I just want to show really quickly that in, in Russia, there's um, quite a lot of development towards Europe. This is Russia road and rail networks. But it, there's also quite a lot of land that has not yet been developed. Um, Russia is it's huge. There, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of, um, I don't know, I would say internal infrastructural work that needs to be done in the country. I think um, Russia is in the business of profiting off of their natural resources, but domestically and politically domestically, I think they're going to be really working on kind of developing themselves. Um, providing infrastructure for the people, providing opportunities for, for new businesses and new cities, especially as some of these Arctic ports become more and more um, uh, capital hubs and everything. So I think, I think this is interesting to bring up from, from the Russian and, and Arctic perspective because um, I think Russia is going to be focusing domestically, just putting some resources into this um, in terms of where, where their attention is. It's not like they're going to be building out on the North Pole or something like that. They're going to be, you know, building this area out. And then one kind of provocative idea um, that, that I thought was great that one of my colleagues uh, gave me a, f a few months ago was, was this. She, she flipped the um, map of, of Russia upside down, and it looks kind of like our Gulf of Mexico. So I think it's really important to understand that um, Russia might view the Arctic Ocean the way we in the U.S. have viewed the Gulf of Mexico, just like let's, let's extract everything we can out of it all the time, and who cares if there's like pollution and whatever. I mean, well, I'm, I'm not saying I, I don't believe that, but that's like the predominant um, mindset of, of the American people. Like the Gulf of Mexico um, really provide, provided a lot of opportunity for American businesses, um, and we have to think of the Arctic Ocean as providing a lot of opportunity for, for Russian businesses. So I, I have some takeaways. Um, Ukraine needs support in terms of governance and not just money. I talked a lot about, I just made a lot of comments about how corrupt it is. Um, and I feel like I can do that because I talked to a lot of Ukrainians. But, but <laughs> so, um, I didn't really substantiate it so much in this talk. But, but the reality is um, the state needs help. And you, the EU and the US just giving Ukraine money so that they can pay off their, their like, uh, mob boss is not like a solution to this. So, so I think it's really important that if Ukraine is going to be able to kind of functionally survive, um, Ukraine needs some help in terms of governance and, and the, the nitty gritty of, of governing their, their, their state. Russia is in the business of profiting off of land and resources. I've kind of been hammering that home in the last few minutes. Um, Arctic cooperation may be strained, but is likely to remain. Uh, I, think, I think what I, I just said a few minutes ago about this um, kind of explains that as well as kind of what Ross mentioned earlier. Sanctions may accelerate Russian economic partnership with the East. We've seen they're, they're moving towards China. There's, there's a lot more uh, pictures with Putin in China with, with the, the premier over there. Um, and I wanted to just sort of start off with a question for you all as we move into a discussion. Um, is self-determination more important than territorial integrity? So if we think about maybe South Sudan, for example, in Sudan, we really, in Africa is kind of messed up place in terms of colonialism and everything. But I think that we've always believed that, you know, if the people of South Sudan want to be South Sudan, then they should be South Sudan and not Sudan anymore. Um, it's just kind of provocative because what if the people of Crimea don't want to be part of Ukraine anymore? Uh, we're, come down, we're coming down pretty hard as, a we as the West in terms of saying, no, 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 you have to keep these boundaries. So I wonder if there's something deeper behind that, something like psychologically in this whole Russia um, West thing that's going on there. So anybody have any ideas on that or any, any thoughts or any other questions? Yeah. How do you conflate uh, like American and Western <laughs> like European neo-colonialism and like economic relationships they have with certain countries where a lot of people would consider it pretty, uh, would consider it that the West is almost taking advantage of those countries. How would you conflate that with their kind of harsh reaction to Russia's 
you know, actual colonialism with Crimea. So like economic, for example, France's economic colonialism and neo-colonialism in Africa, how, how do they conflate that with Russia going into Crimea? How can they say they're against it if they're doing fundamentally similar things? So you're saying that the economic colonialism is different than the than the no, political No, I'm asking colonial? how, how sure. the West, which participates in, how some of which participates in neo-colonialist practices, can then go and say that what Russia is doing in Crimea is wrong. Oh, oh, well, yeah, like, ha. <laughs> um. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's kind of a big question. <laughs> yeah, um, right. So somehow, somehow we we were able to. Uh, keep the boundaries of our our economics world is is, is not uh, the political world, and the political world is not the economics world, or we somehow think that. But in reality, what you're saying is that there, or suggest maybe suggesting what idea comes is that there might be much more closely linked. Yeah, I think if if we talked about that a little bit more about how um, the U.S. is or in the West is kind of extracting from other people, that that might be kind of self-reflective moment. <laughs> Interesting idea. How many people would that be? I, I, I'm not sure the, the numbers, to, to be honest. I'm sorry. Any other? What's the price of uh, gas that Russia is selling? At what, what price? To so I heard yesterday in the, there was a like, dialogue between Putin and Ukraine that was like mediated by the EU in Brussels. So they're talking about 385 uh, per, per thousand cubic feet, I think. Of 385? 385, and, and EU, um, yeah, I think it was US dollars. And I think it's 350 for the rest of the EU that Russia sells. But Russia had been saying six months ago that they're gonna charge 485 That's to, cheap, to Ukraine. Um, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure right now what it is in the U.S. Um, and I might. I might have the units wrong too because it's in Europe. I, I. I just. I just saw this yesterday, and I, I was, the numbers were <laughs> what stuck in my mind, not the the units. That's not so. That's not so good. But but um, they've lowered their their like negotiating threshold. Um, yeah, that might be on the the wholesale market. So. Yeah, I think uh, what Europeans pay is much higher in general. How much of the gas that goes through the Ukraine stays in Ukraine? Or does it go on to Europe? It looks like all the pipelines go on and keep going on. Yeah, most of it goes on. So um, what do they do? Do they resell it? What does Ukraine do? The Ukraine gets all this gas from Russia. They don't, they don't, they don't use all that much. So then what do they do? So, so the pipelines are going through them, and they consume a certain amount, but the pipelines still deliver to the rest of Europe. And right now, um, right now Russia has uh, figured out a way to cut off Ukraine from their pipelines, yet still, um, well, I mean, that's, it's not so difficult from an engineering perspective. You just go in and sort of like close that part of the tap. Um, but they're delivering to the rest of Europe right now. So, so right now, there's a, a negotiation because Russia has cut off Ukraine because of debts, and Ukraine is still paying these debts and borrowing money from, I think just taking money actually from, from mainly Germany um, to pay off these debts. And the issue is that nobody's quite sure how much gas they got. So how much gas they, Ukraine has got? Yeah, because you said they weren't there arguing about what they owe. Because these filters or whatever were, were not very accurate. So it's been it's uh, so so Ukraine owes gas from a years of not paying for gas according to Russia, um, uh, and according to the Ukraine. But it's the number of the amount of energy that they consume that is being disputed, and the rate at which they they should pay is also being disputed, and how much interest and so on. So it's billions of euros. Uh, I think 3.2 billion euros remaining. And I think yesterday Germany said they would give two billion of those, I think. Um, so Ukraine still needs to come up with some money somehow. I mean, are we up in the Arctic? 
presently bouncing off ships and planting flags right now as the ice recedes? Russia did that uh, five years ago, but uh, I think that was. I mean, we're scrambling out there right now, claiming land, right? Planning no. Um, I don't think so. Resources. Resources, that, that's well defined. Um, the, the states have a 200 mile economic zone off, the, off their coasts. Um, and certain, certain states have overlap where, where they're kind of like, you know, join each other. And those, there's a formal process for how they, they work that out with each other. Um, and a lot of these processes have already begun. And there was, uh, you know, Norway and Russia, they talk about it. Okay, you have this you have the right to ocean resources up to this point. And there's a formal process for, for doing that. Uh, how do you think the kind of uh, preparations or just just that thoughts have been provoked about how they're going to deal with dependence on Russian oil has made the EU think just about their general dependence on natural resources in the long run? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think that's maybe more interesting than the majority of my talk. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, it's been... It's been uh, Surprising to me. So some 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 European member states come in, and they're like, "That's it. We're right. G give us coal and uh, uh, let us frack." That's that's like Poland. Poland is like, "All right, we told you, Russia's Russia's a beast. Like you have to let us build more coal plants. Forget all these climate regulations and, and laws. Like you have to let us do this. We don't want Russia uh, holding a gun to our head." That's that's Poland's argument. Um, and, and other states are you know, a little bit more like, no, 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 more renewables. Uh, it's not going to help that much, but it's going to help. Uh, but it's a, real, it's a real debate right now. What is Europe's long-term strategy? And I, I showed you, you know, Desert Tech was like one of these pipe dreams. It's not going to really happen as they wanted. Um, that would have done something like 80% uh, renewables by 2050. And, and it's unclear how they're going to do that. I mean, Europe will or they, they, there's a law that Europe will be, or sorry, it's target that they'll hit 80% by 2050. But at every step, the, the European Commission comes um, every few years and, and basically makes it a law, or that's the plan. They'll make, basically make it a binding kind of target over time, because Europe actually does take these things pretty seriously. Um, but it, it seems right now that they're, they just keep kicking the can down the road. Actually, earlier this year, there was a big European Union level election. so. All I keep hearing is, oh, we're going to like think about it again when the new, <laughs> when the new government's in. So the, the new government has like started last month in September. Um, and they have a whole bunch of other things that they're dealing with now. So it, it's unclear what the strategy is from a European perspective. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of different member states have a lot of varying ideas on it. Poland just screams the loudest. Any other thoughts? Back to the Arctic. Where does how does Canada play into it? Don't they? If you look at people surrounding the Arctic, it's yeah. primarily Russian Canada. So, so how do they play into the Ukraine situation or how, the, no, the energy situation? The energy situation. Energy situation. Um, I mean, I, I think um, for for the EU, for the EU, excuse me, or for for Russia, or and what Who what's what's. Which which energy? In the Arctic. Well, Canada will get the en the the energy that it is within its two hundred mile um, zone, I guess, and the U.S. will get the energy in its two hundred mile zone up in Alaska, um, if they want to do more drilling <laughs> offshore. Uh, but these these offshore resources are still a good ten years away from being like really profitable. The main reason that Exxon and some of these European companies are kind of pursuing it is they want to diversify their supply as they as some of their other um, fields are drying up or, or not producing the way or becoming more expensive or facing stricter regulation or something like that. So we, we will see maybe in Canada, I'm not sure how good the resource is and they're part of the Arctic, some further uh, exploration, I'm sure. Um, but this also has to do with the kind of environmental Arctic um, guidelines <laughs> that might be initiated before that point. Is, is the Ukrainian government doing anything uh, to develop some kind of independent source for gas 
independent of Russia for Ukraine? Is there any or source of mm. power? You know, I, I'm not. Um, I think their their big goals right now are, are first of all reducing because there's a lot of waste. So so obviously they'll they, they want to really get things in order so they don't have to keep buying so much. And then um, I, I'm not sure what their strategy is. I think that what they're do what they're going to do is they're going to buy it from from EU. So Slovakia, Germany. I think I mentioned this. Germany is going to be buying gas from Russia and then selling it to Ukraine. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> Um, so, so in the short term, they're going to be importing it from Europe. And there should be enough, well, there won't be enough to meet this gap, but um, you know, a good chunk of it might come with, from Norway if they kind of ramp up production, because Norway has some extra they could tap into as well. Uh, but the, number, the numbers aren't good. I mean, Ukraine's going to be, Ukraine's going to be hurt um, this winter if, if there's no agreement. Well, thank you very much. Yes, for thank you, Adam. Yeah, yeah.